You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hey, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 65 of the Common Descent Podcast. 65. That has a five in it. Yes, it does. Which means we are back on the subject of extinction. Death. As is tradition. This particular episode, we are talking about the mass extinction of the late Devonian. Ooh. This is one of the big five. We've mm-hmm. gone through, th- this is the fourth of the big five. Now, I mean, we're almost, we're almost out of big fives. We're almost out. The Devonian, the late Devonian extinction is an interesting one because it occurs around the time that, you know, vertebrates were taking off. Yes. Land ecosystems were really taking off. In the midst of this new world, this mass extinction occurs. It's also fascinating because it's probably multiple extinctions, maybe several extinctions, some of which might not be extinctions at all. (laughs) It's going to get real interesting. It's going to be a lot of fun. (laughs) As with all mass extinctions, it laid the foundation for the world as we know it, so it'll be fun to discuss. Yeah. This episode topic was requested by Matthew on Twitter, so thank you, Matthew. Thank you. And someone on the survey suggested that we do the Big Five extinctions. So we're working on it. One left. (laughs) We've done the End Cretaceous, episode 5, the Mm -hmm. End Triassic, episode 15, the End Permian, episode 45, and now the Devonian. All that's left is the Ordovician. Yep. So if you want to hear that, listeners, or if you have another extinction idea, let us know. Ten more to go until the next extinction episode. But before we get into our discussion, a few announcements. As always, this podcast is supported by the generous donations of our patrons. And if you are a patron of a certain level, we will call out your name on the podcast. This episode, we are shouting out to Beth. Hi, Beth. Thanks for supporting us, Beth. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Speaking of Patreon, patrons get extra bonus goodies, including bonus audios. Mm-hmm. After last episode, episode 64, when we had our special guest, Gabriel Ghetto, to talk to us about paleo art, we recorded an after chat episode with Gabriel. Talked more about art and science and how science is perceived by the public. Check out that conversation on patreon for patrons who get access to bonus audios yeah also speaking of patreon a huge thanks to all of the patrons who supported us and helped us get to napc last month thank you thank you thank you we were in southern california for the north american paleontological conference we gave a talk Mm -hmm. we got to meet all sorts of cool people lots of networking it was awesome We owe our patrons a big thanks for helping to make that trip possible for us. Also, because of NAPC, for our listeners, it's been a regular two weeks in between episodes. Yeah. But it feels like forever since we've recorded an episode. Oh, it's so so weird. I feel like it's been months. Because we did the last episode we recorded early. Yep. And this episode we're recording later than usual. Yep. And in between was a big trip. Yep. So it feels like forever. It's it's weird, so I'm getting back into the swing of it. As a reminder, in case you missed it, last month we did a special series about movies, Kai Jun. If you haven't, check it out. And, looking to the future, our next big trip... Yes. As August turns into September, we will be heading down to Atlanta for our return to Dragon Con. Dragon Con! So if you're going to be at Dragon Con or if you're going to be in the Atlanta area, we will be on several panels. Yes, a smattering. Both of us. We don't have a definite schedule yet, but we have reason to believe Mm -hmm. we will be on panels about paleontology and about uh, one of our favorite subjects, speculative evolution. So it should be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll keep you updated with the details as we know the details. Yeah, we'll, once we know for sure where we'll be, we'll let you know where you can find us. Yes, hopefully we'll see some of our listeners that we got to meet last year. Yes. So let us know if you're going to be there. I'm so excited. But of course, uh, as as with every episode, we must move on. 
from the announcements to the news. Oh, hey, I like that. Every episode, we pick some news from the world of paleontology and discuss it. Paleontology evolution, stuff like that. Will. Yeah. What news have you for us? Crocodile news. What? Okay. (laughs) And my news. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's get it over with. It's it's been a very popular few weeks (laughs) for crocodile news. This is news about plant-eating croc cousins, which we've discussed before, but it's a new look at how common this trend is in the crocodiliform family tree. Interesting. Yeah. So this is research by Keegan Maelstrom and Randall Ermis, and this is published in Current Biology. The article we'll be linking to is by Tim Verneman in National Geographic. This is an extensive analysis of modern and fossil crocs looking at dentition their teeth because there are some things you can look at when setting a tooth that will hint you toward their diet even when they're fairly simple teeth right even though the teeth aren't you know it's not the classic knife tooth shearing tooth because like mammals we have our teeth uh, hide nothing they leave nothing to the imagination yes straightforward so but reptile teeth sometimes are a, a little more subtle and sometimes seem much closer together than they actually are so it can be tricky so they did a they did a study using a technique especially developed to compare dissimilar teeth originally in mammals they're using it in crocodile forms so this is something that counts the surfaces of a tooth Ooh. So when you zoom in on a tooth and actually look at the differing surfaces where where planes meet at, if it's not much of an edge, still an edge, and counting those surfaces can give you an idea for what they might have been eating. Not for sure, but might have, because typically carnivores have very simplistic teeth, mm-hmm. and herbivores are going to have much more complex teeth for grinding and shearing and shredding hard, tough plant, whilst meat eaters may only need something that's sharp for grabbing. Well, they looked at 146 fossilized teeth belonging to 16 different extinct crocodilian relatives. Cool. That's a good sample. Good sample size. And what they came up with is that some of these extinct crocodiliform teeth had up to 20 separate surfaces. Ooh. So it's not just a simple cone all the way across the groups. So if you drop it on a table, you can make an attack roll. Yes, exactly. It'll let you know how well you're doing. There are indications in this study that said at least three times in the history of the crocodilian lineage, separate groups have become or at least lean toward a vegetarian lifestyle. Interesting. So separately, it seems to be that there are three lineages of herbivorous croc cousins. And this becomes much more interesting because we'd known about herbivorous crocs, but the question of how common was it and was it a single lineage that got weird, stayed weird, and then went extinct? Or with this new information, is it something that was actually a viable strategy for crocs that meat eating is not always the only successful way to go one of the most complex teeth they note is from simosuchus which we've mentioned before on the podcast yeah madagascar yes and this is that adorable little pug croc with the flat face and then i want to cuddle (laughs) this one had extremely complex teeth so we've known this one was herbivorous but it is especially so so its teeth even say that it was a dedicated herbivore so much so that its teeth are remarkably similar to those of the modern Galapagos iguanas, marine iguanas. Really? Which are also herbivorous, Yeah. but they are eating algae off of rocks. Yeah. Now, there doesn't seem to be suggestions that Simosuchus was aquatic itself, but it may have been feeding on the edges of water in a similar way, because it has very similar teeth. So, not just herbivorous crocs but specialized herbivores so not i'm not just chewing on leaves i'm chewing on very specific things 
So this really opens up that crocs had alternate survival strategies than just your you know predator on land or water. There are hopes that this study can be replicated uh, with further specimens and further fossil species to expand the data range and better get a better picture of exactly what they're looking at. Uh, there are cautioning uh, scientists saying that tooth morphology does not always match diet. Yeah. There are many times where you can find animals eating something you would not think they would based off their teeth. So this is not a definite on the herbivorous croc lineages. Uh, but this also raises a big question that if it was successful, uh, why did none of them survive till today? Yeah, We've lost all the herbivorous croc lineages, even though some modern crocodilians do take fruit and veggies right they dabble in, yeah yeah you know but not not any dedicated way so this, yeah this is a great demonstration of how we can be misled by the living members of a group that it's easy to look at living crocodilians and go oh that's what crocodilians do and miss that there have been all these wonderful variations in the past it's actually not super surprising to hear that we've lost all the herbivorous crocs because it sounds like that's more of a specialized lifestyle. And as we discuss often in extinction episodes, the more specialized you are, the more likely it is that a disturbance to the ecosystem is going to really throw a wrench into your evolutionary line. Absolutely. And they actually mentioned uh, something to your first point that it is a common... Uh, 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 oversight that we paleontologists can make to use the modern taxa as the standard. Yes. And that there are lots of examples like modern sloths where they are by no means the norm. And it turns out modern crocs might also be in a similar kind of category. Not as extreme, but... Yeah, but they're not. That, that's not what all crocs are exactly. like. Exactly. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I've brought along some news from our friends at the Gray Fossil Site. I know them. If you've listened to us ever, you've probably heard about the Gray Fossil <laughs> Site. Fossil Site here in East Tennessee, where we are now both located. Yeah. But this research is not about the Gray Fossil Site, but colleagues of ours who have done work on a different site. Cool. This is research about the social habits of extinct peccaries from the Ice Age. Nice. Which is pretty cool. That's a good lead-in. This is research by an old uh, student, fellow student of ours, Aaron Woodruff, and our professor, former professor, Blaine Schubert. Yeah. They examined peccary remains. So peccaries are basically the New World, the Americas version of pigs. They You see a peccary in the wild, it's going to look a lot like a wild boar. In some places, they're also called javelinas. But peccaries are native to North America. They are still around today. They've been around for a very, very long time. We find them at the Gray Fossil Site, which is about 5 million years old, and all throughout the Ice Age, the Pleistocene. This particular research looked at peccaries from a cave, a delightfully named cave, Bat Cave, Bat cave. in Missouri, in the Ozarks, that preserves a lot of peccary fossils. In fact, the authors note that it is one of the best peccary collections in the world. Aaron and Blaine went through this assortment of fossils that was pulled out of this cave a few decades ago and counted more than 70 individual peccaries. Wow. And it's always exciting to have a lot because then you can look at population structures. So they looked at the teeth. When I talked to Aaron about it, he said that he was looking at the teeth one day, laid out the, the jaws that were preserved in these peccaries, and noticed that they fell, they seemed to fall in distinct age groups. Like brackets. Like age brackets. So when you look at teeth, uh, particularly an animal like pe mammals are great for this, based on the development of the tooth and the wear on the tooth, you can estimate the age of the animal. Because just like in humans, the teeth develop as you grow, and as they're used, they're going to accumulate wear. So researchers have come up with little guidelines that basically say, if you see this kind of development and this level of wear, it's three years old. That, that's useful. So they went through and did that. 
Now, what you would expect to find when you do that in a normal population is a continuous spectrum of ages, every stage along the way, which is not what they saw. They found that a bunch of the peccaries appear to have been just about one year old, a bunch were just about two, just about three, but none of them appeared to be one and a half mm. or two and three quarters. Each age group was separated by nine to 12 months. So the cave is only collecting peccaries at a certain time of their life. Yearly. Which suggests two things. One, that the peccaries were not being born all year round. Makes sense. Because if they were being born all year round, a population would always have just a continuous spectrum, right? It just If peccaries are being born every month, there's going to be no gap between the ages of the peccaries. But lots of modern animals, including peccary populations, give birth during a breeding season. The other thing that it suggests is that the cave was only occupied by peccaries certain times of the year. Because if they were in the cave all year round and the cave was collecting fossils all year, it doesn't matter when they're being born, you're going to be collecting them at all parts of their lives. So this suggests, in a population of late Pleistocene peccaries, tens of thousands of years old, that they were giving birth seasonally and sheltering in caves seasonally. The authors, our friends, suspect that, like some modern peccary populations, they were giving birth in the spring and hanging out in caves in the winter for shelter. And it's awesome <laughs> that they're able to interpret this from fossils. This is one of those almost eerily precise observations about, uh, very personal <laughs> observation about the life habits of an extinct animal, uh, a past animal. I love it from a nerdy point of view because it means if we were to time travel to that area to that time, we'd know when to hunt peccaries and caves. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you would. And that's crazy and awesome. <laughs> this kind of research has been done on other animals. So uh, there was a study on bison at La Brea, I believe, that found the same sort of evidence the same sort of way. They were also able to get an age structure of the peccaries. So they found that between the ages of one and four, there was a pretty even distribution of peccaries. But every age group past four, there were fewer and fewer. Okay. Up to nine. The oldest peccaries they found were nine years old. That suggests that mortality was increasing after four or five years old, which is also what we see in modern peccaries. Which is super cool to look at evidence in the fossil record and go, oh, that matches what we see today. Yeah. And have that corroboration. Pancreas are not only long-lasting, but consistent. Yes. Which is... <laughs> that's always intriguing to me when animals are still surviving in a very similar way, even with the changes that the the planet has experienced or their ecosystem has experienced since then. Yeah. That's very cool. These are a different genus of peccaries than what we have today, but still living in very similar ways. Uh, they don't have a definite age on the cave just yet, late Pleistocene, so tens of thousands of years old. So it's not been super long, but it's a whole different group of peccaries. Yeah. Fascinating to be able to interpret their behavior. Very cool. I like it. Now, normally, uh -huh. we would have two more newses. Yeah. But we're going to do a special, uh, a very selfish bit of news. We uh, interrupt your news broadcast. We interrupt the normal news. Uh, we gave a talk at NAPC. Yes, we did. A talk about the podcast and about how we've worked the podcast, sort of what our approach has been. And we recorded it. Yep. And we figured now's a great time to share it. Yeah, because we talk about you all a whole bunch. We do. We mention all of our listeners. So in lieu of our other two newses, we're going to present one news and it's news about us. Yeah. Presented by us. So that's pretty cool. Also, before we go over to that... Uh, as our listeners will know, oftentimes at the end of episodes, we will answer patron questions, mm -hmm. questions from our patrons. Well, Cheryl, one of our patrons, asked a question recently that is answered in this talk. <laughs> Cheryl asked, 
as of this moment or whenever you answer the question, how many topics do you have on your list for possible episodes? So keep an ear out while you're listening to this uh, recording and you will hear the answer to that. A stealth answer. So now, without further ado, we take it over to us. In California. In <laughs> in the past. <laughs> Good? Yeah. All right. <laughs> hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, NAPC. We are... Hello? That's, we never get a response from yeah. you. That's fantastic. That's never happened before. <laughs> I didn't even pause for it. <laughs> We are the hosts of the Common Descent Podcast, a podcast about paleontology, life history, etc., hosted by two huge nerds about that subject. Uh, before we get started, please raise your hand if you are a regular listener of one or more podcasts. Awesome. And Laura just presented some wonderful uh, information about why podcasts are beneficial, what you can do with them. They're relatively easy to do, and they're relatively easy for people to access. Just out of curiosity, please raise your hand if you are a listener of our podcast. All right, cool. Mostly people we know. That's <laughs> <laughs> the podcast got started. Uh, so uh, before I say that, uh, there are a lot of science podcasts out there. There are a bunch of paleontology podcasts. Our goal for this talk is basically to give you a glimpse under the hood of how we do it and what's worked for us. Common Descent started in early 2017, basically when we said, hey, what if we made a podcast? Yeah, we talk a lot. Let's just record it and put it online. Yeah. <laughs> so the idea is we are, we had no, we didn't know anything about podcasting. Arguably, we still don't know a ton about podcasting. Nope. We are both paleontologists. We are both experienced science communicators. We figure scientific discussions are fun. Yeah. And... People, the general public doesn't often get to hear scientific discussions that sound like what happens in the hall outside the lecture room, right? We wanted people to get a sense that academic scientific discussions can be fun and exciting and can be full of movie references and stuff, and we don't have to sound like Ferris Bueller's economics teacher. Yeah. Every episode we start with roughly 30 minutes of news, pulling news from around the paleontology research sphere. And then we pick a main discussion for a, an hour. <laughs> Our discussion topics range, it could be a group of animals that we're talking about. We'll talk about their evolutionary history, their fossil record. Uh, we did an episode recently about all about amber. Every now and then we do little spin-offs. Mm -hmm. Like this week, uh, this month, we've had a movie science spin-off. All about movie monsters. Every episode, uh, we release episodes every fortnight. Every episode comes with a blog post that has links and photos and stuff that we can't do in the audio format. Like I said, we're, our target is the general audience. We're hoping to just let people get a chance to hear what scientific discussion sounds like and also to have fun. We want it to be, you know, we're excited and we want people to get that. Yeah, and we mostly do this in our free time. Uh, we started just free time in our own funds, but now we have had a Patreon for just about two, two years, years. Yeah. and it funds everything. It actually is what brought me to the conference here, so it uh, supports us. We also have a store where you can buy cool products. We have merch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what's actually financially supporting us right now. Yeah, mostly it's Patreon. Mm -hmm. This gives us very little. That's mostly for the yeah. engagement. <laughs> Now, click. Click. Uh, once again, like I did before, raise your hand again if you are a regular listener of a podcast. Now, raise your hand if you regularly reach out to those podcasters to provide feedback and tell them what you think. Yeah. So this is a big issue that we run into is it's very hard to know who we're reaching and what our audience thinks. Uh, fortunately, so we host on Podbean. There are a lot of websites where you can host a podcast. Podbean has all these wonderful analytics that'll track downloads and such. We are using the cheap version of Podbean because pay, our patrons are wonderful, but Podbean is expensive. Yep. Uh, the expensive levels, you can do all sorts of cool stuff. What we do is we pull this out and put it into an Excel sheet and mess around with the numbers, which allows us to track all sorts of cool statistics. This chart is our weekly total downloads. This one's a lot of fun. That one is how many downloads each new episode gets on the first day of release. And we are rapidly approaching a thousand. I, I suspect the next episode. Hopefully, 
I, I'm saying the next episode is going to be the one that beats it. So every episode is getting a thousand downloads on its first day, usually several hundred, a few hundred, within the week after that. And we also do uh, geographical statistics, or we get ge geographical statistics. We mostly are English-speaking countries, U.S., U.K., Australia, Canada, places like that. But we, going down the list, get all sorts of countries. And it's this is cool for us to see who's listening, but it also reminds us to keep in mind that we're, we have a global audience and to uh, uh, include that in our speech as we talk. Yeah, one person in Guyana downloaded our podcast last yep. month, which is pretty cool. <laughs> We also have uh, experimented a little bit with actually asking the audience directly. So a year into the podcast, we did a survey where we asked a bunch of open-ended questions. How did you find us? We were very interested in people's relationship to science. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to reach a general audience, but at least a year ago, a, more than a quarter of our audience is researchers, yeah. people like yourselves who are already in science. This was also an opportunity for us to get more open-ended feedback. Uh, compliments, which yes, we like. Which are good. Criticisms. Which we're taking into consideration. We're working on it. <laughs> uh, also, and I didn't put this on here, we have a few different ways to track gender demographics. And our Facebook and Twitter look exactly like mm -hmm. what you showed for PaleoCast. 50-50 on Twitter, 2 to 1 men to women on Facebook. And the survey was closer to Facebook. Mm. Listener engagement is super important to us. We want to, you know, our podcast is mostly us talking. Yes. We have guests on occasionally. We're doing that more and more. But we really want our listeners to know that we're also listening to them. Most of that engagement is online. Yeah. Twitter and email and Facebook, people tell us what they think. Sometimes they complain to us. That's okay. <laughs> Sometimes we get lucky. This fella is one of our, for like two years, this guy's been a huge fan of the podcast. He got to come visit us at the Gray Fossil site. Was that last month? Yeah. Last month. <laughs> uh, we don't know who that person is. We were at Dragon Con, and someone was dressed in a dinosaur costume, so we got a picture with them. <laughs> but that is a future listener. Yes, hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> Our most successful approach to listener engagement has been listener requests. These days, every episode of the, top, of the podcast is a topic that a listener requested. At the end of every episode, we say, if you have an idea for an episode topic, let us know. And boy, do they. Yeah. We get re we, people comment out to us on Twitter and Facebook and through email, through Patreon. Sometimes in person. Yes. We've yes. had our friends text us or something. In the two and a half years we've been doing this, we have received, I have to stand over here and read it, 366 total requests for 263 different topics from 165 people and one squirrel. <laughs> and because we handed this uh, PowerPoint into the speaker ready room last, yesterday morning, this is out of date. Yep. We received one request on Twitter uh, yesterday afternoon to do an episode about La Brea. Yes. How convenient. <laughs> Most of these we have not addressed yet. Mm -hmm. If we stop taking requests today, we'd have four years of content to go on <laughs> off of just this list. About 80% of the podcast episodes have been requested topics, but don't let that fool you. We have not done a non-requested topic in almost two years. Yeah, that was the first year where we were doing our own ideas, and then since then we've just been using the ideas given to us. Episode 64 comes out next week, Paleo Art. It's going to be awesome. And we haven't done a non-requested episode since 20. Yeah. And the real benefit to this is it means that our topics are directly linked to what our listeners are interested in. We know that at least one or a few people want to hear about that topic. It also means that we get a much wider variety of topic concepts for the podcast than we would have come up with. We made, we made a very short list when we first started, like 20 concepts to just start with. And since then, we've gotten things like the Bone Wars and uh, we did Amber. A, we did a Baculum episode. A Baculum episode. Because it was requested. By request. <laughs> and so this gives us a huge variety and then finally, the listeners actually get to participate. We thank whoever requested, whether it was one or multiple people, every time we do a requested episode. Yep. And then that means they get to hear themselves, but we're also including the listener base into the making of the episode, which we really like. Yeah. Our patrons can also ask us questions that mm -hmm. we can answer on the podcast. So we start trying to get our listeners involved. But as we are fond of saying, uh, this is not our final form. 
We don't know what the final form of the podcast is going to be, but we suspect it looks a lot like this. The more we are doing the podcast, the more we're getting guests involved, the more we're doing collaborative projects. Uh, Laura just mentioned the PaleoCast Gaming Network, and we've been talking with Dave about getting mm -hmm. involved in that. Uh, some of these people you'll recognize in the room, and these very unflattering pictures that <laughs> I pulled up on Twitter. Uh, we've built a platform, and we think that the most powerful thing that we've managed to do is, you know, we have all these listeners, we have these people who are, are willing to listen to us, you know, go on about stuff. Each episode of the podcast is getting a thousand downloads on day one, and that means we can bring other people on and expose our audience to different people. It means we can go off and we were on um, Science Sort of. Yep. We've, we've done some collaborations with other podcasts. And it's wonderful. It's really great to be able to cross those audiences. Uh, we also have been making some public appearances. Like I said, we were at Dragon Con last year. We got to hang out with Trevor Valley and do a panel about mm -hmm. the science of Jurassic World, yep. which quickly devolved into just people asking paleontology questions, which is better. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going back. Yes, we'll be back there this year. So this is what the future of our endeavor is going to look like. And we are looking for more and more opportunities to work together with other people, with other projects, to, you know, it's mostly mm -hmm. these two voices, and that's been fine, but we want to move in more varied directions. Yeah, science is collaborative, so we feel the podcast should be as well. Indeed. Up here on this podium, it has been mostly the, it, well, it's been entirely the two of us talking. <laughs> The podcast itself is mostly the two of us, but already the podcast is extremely a, a major collaborative effort, which is why our acknowledgments page looks like this. We owe an enormous thanks to all of the people who have lent their voices to our podcast in one way or another. Some of these people are in the room. Thank you very much. Yes. All of our listeners, especially the ones who give us money, which is just so appreciated. We are constantly amazed that people are willing to pay for this. Yep. <laughs> and they do. We've got, these are mostly current. Some of these are people who used to donate and don't anymore. Um, yeah, it's, it's incredible that we have all the support. Mm -hmm. All of our listeners, our friends who have helped us along the way, and all of the people in the future that we're going to inevitably end up working with. Yeah. And with that, if you have any questions... We will gladly uh, answer some. <laughs> yes, you so, in the front. <laughs> with so many topics, and you guys, and, you know, none of us are experts on everything. So how do you, and how much time does it take to prep? When somebody has a request. We uh, currently, the way we've been doing it is we alternate who leads an episode, which gives each of us week, week and a half, maybe two weeks, depending on how efficient we were on the last episode, to do some online research, note taking, and then we, we've adjusted a recording times if we need a couple extra days to put things in order. Uh, but yeah, we give ourselves uh, definitely at least a solid week to get a basic base outline for whatever topic we're doing. So it's a lot of prep. Yeah. Except when we have guests on. Yes. So and next, then, next weekend, Gabriel Ugeto is a paleo artist, and we didn't have to do any prep. Then we just listened. Interview him. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you find that there's any difference in, say, viewership or downloads or anything from the different episodes of Because I saw you had, like, just the one-hour episodes for the special ones, but then some of them were running on close to two hours for the... Other episodes that you chose, yeah. so is there a difference at all in the metrics for those? Or? We, I haven't, haven't we, we haven't noticed any difference in length. The, so the numbered episodes uh, always get more downloads than the little the, the spin-off things, which tend to be shorter. Um, you'd think there'd be a correlation with the more exciting titles, but there's not. We we've, we've not been able to tease out exactly what makes people download one episode over another. Yeah. Uh, but length doesn't seem to affect it because we've had that discussion. We've felt bad when we've gone like a full two hours talking about spinosaurus because we couldn't stop. But now we haven't noticed that, at least not yet. And our comments seem to be 50 50, where we'll get one person who's like, maybe a little less rambling, another person who goes, You could have gone an hour longer. I would have been happy. <laughs> yeah. We better let you move on. Sorry. Right. Sure, sure. No problem. And speaking of moving on, now that the news is over, 
let's move on and talk about our feature presentation, The Late Devonian Extinction. Bum, bum. We discuss extinction a lot on this podcast. Yeah, we tend to bring it up a bunch. It's macabre. Yeah. But just as a refresher, extinction, of course, is when a group, a clade, a species, a subspecies, a family, a genus, vanishes forever. Dead end. Yeah. This is a normal thing. Yeah. Extinction happens all the time. In fact, paleontologists have worked hard to identify a background extinction rate. That is... As this much time passes, how many extinctions do we expect to see? Yeah, sh- how, how uh, just for an average, should be happening? As ecosystems continue to change, as organisms continue to evolve in response to each other, things go extinct, new species arise, that's the normal way. Mass extinctions are times when the extinction rate is way higher than it should be. Yeah, we see a spike. Way higher than normal. Something has gone wrong. We've discussed a whole bunch of these on the podcast. Very famously, decades ago, when paleontologists put together early charts of diversity through Earth history, they noticed five times in the last 500 or so million years, the Phanerozoic Eon, where extinction rates seemed to be crazy high. Yeah. They called these the Big Five. Now, since then, our resolution has gotten a lot better. The big five aren't the only five. They Some of them might actually be multiple extinctions in one. It's a little bit confusing, but we still refer to the big five in this historical context. We've talked about three of the big five on the podcast already. Today, we are discussing another, the late Devonian yes. mass extinction. But before we get into that, let's talk about the Devonian period. Cool. Let's set the stage. We're going to do the thing at the beginning of the movie. Act one. We're setting the, what do they call that in the the journey? Oh, the the it's this isn't I don't I guess we wouldn't quite be the rising action. This is not the, yet. Yeah, it's the it's when it's there. Someone in our someone in listening is is having a fit because they is, know what this is. This is when the camera's panning over the neighborhood and a <laughs> ominous narrator is everything was peaceful. The Devonian period sits roughly halfway through the Paleozoic era starting around 420 million years ago and ending around 359 million years ago. This is before the Mesozoic Age of Reptiles, way before the Age of Mammals. This is a time where most familiar vertebrate groups don't exist yet. Yeah. We don't have reptiles. There are no birds, no mammals. There are fish. More on that in a second. (laughs) And the world doesn't look quite like it does today. During the the Devonian, continental land masses were split into mostly two major chunks. Some of our familiar northern continents were joined in a continent that is called Euramerica, which included... Your America. My America. Europe, North America, some other land masses like Greenland, I believe, was part of it. This was a big supercontinent that sat at and around the equator. And then way down south was Gondwana. Yes. Gondwana... South Am- South America, Africa, Australia, Antarctica, India, the southern continents, the all stuff. in one. Eventually, as the Paleozoic era moved on, these two supercontinents would join to form Pangaea. But during the De- Devonian, that had not happened just yet. This is pre-Pangaea. Pre-Pangaea. The Devonian period had a generally warm climate, globally, and, as is often the case with warm climates, high sea levels. The configuration of the continents and the high sea level and the fact that your America was in near the equator in the tropics meant that there were lots of shallow tropical oceans. Which brings us to the life in the Devonian. (laughs) One of the most interesting features of the Devonian period was that there were huge extensive reef systems. Yeah. This was a great time for reefs. Reefs were really kicking it up a notch during this time one of the papers that i read described the middle of the devonian as having the most geographically widespread reef ecosystems in earth's history which is significant to say 
more specifically, animal reef ecosystems, made up of not only algae, because there are reef building algae, as we discussed, we had episode 36 was all about reefs. Yeah. Also a group of sponges called stromatoporoids. Which are cool. Which were reef building sponges. And, just like today, corals. But not corals like today. Not the corals you know. These aren't your dad's corals. Uh, during the Paleozoic, the big groups of corals were the tabulate and rugose corals. Rugose Cor- corals are horn corals. Yeah, the horn corals. And tabulate corals are tabulate corals. <laughs> this, These were the major coral groups at that time. So it would have looked like reefs. They would have been familiar looking reefs, but made of different organisms. It, geometrically, they would have looked different, but it probably would have felt very much like a reef as you're picturing one. Yes. But the animals living in the reef would have been rather different. This was a time when brachiopods were dominant. Yeah. So these, again, they would have looked like clams until you got close and realized that they weren't. (laughs) Kind of weird. There were abundant crinoids, which are your sea lilies, which if you don't know what a crinoid is, it has this segmented stem and then these arms. Yeah, the fan-like feathers. This was a time where there were still abundant trilobites, which are your famous Paleozoic ocean bugs. Yarp. Aminoids. Woo! So our cephalopods are, are around the aminoids, which would eventually include the ammonites, uh, famous in the Mesozoic, were fairly new at this time. So the earliest of the aminoid uh, squid octopus relatives. Which means things are finally getting good in the ocean. There, it's it's We've had nautiloids for a while. <laughs> so we've had those straight-shelled nautiloids with the squid face sticking out. Now we've got this other branch. But the most famous thing happening in the ocean, especially from our vertebrate... Uh, centric perspective is that the Devonian was a time of intense diversification of fish. Yes. It is called the age of fish. Famously, we see the rise to dominance of the placoderms, which we talked about in episode 29. These were armored fish like the famous Dunkleosteus. They're just so cool. Which was great, great white shark sized, but (laughs) armored. Built like a tank. Yeah. An actual fish tank. Yeah. We also see groups like the spiny sharks, the acanthodians. Mm-hmm. True sharks start to take over, true chondrichthians. Bony fish, like most of the fish that you're familiar with today. Uh, fish start to dominate the ocean, right? Prior to this, the dominant ocean life has been invertebrates. In the Devonian, vertebrates start to take over, like it should be, you know. I mean, it's proper order. And one branch of the fish was doing something especially interesting. The Sarcopterygians, the lobe fin fish, by the end of the Devonian, had given rise to the first vertebrates on land. Yeah, they started putting bones in their fins like weirdos. Yeah, like coelacanths. And then they decided to get out of the water. And then they just started doing (laughs) push-ups. So we see the first amphibious vertebrates staying close to the shorelines, famous things like Tiktaalik and uh, uh, Acanthostega and Ichthyostega, early weird tetrapods, four-legged vertebrates on land. Yeah, so not only are vertebrates taking over the the dominant uh, roles, or some of the dominant roles in the ocean, they're also starting to invade the land. Yes, it's an exciting time for us. Yes, it's this is an important turning point. We should all be learning about this in history class. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not alone on land. Mm-mm. Prior to this, the land had been already taken over by arthropods. So early, you know, centipedes and millipedes, early insects and their relatives. Shorelines probably patrolled by sea scorpions. Ooh, yeah. Life on land. This is one of the first periods to have really thriving animal ecosystems on land. And plants. Yeah. The Devonian sees an enormous radiation of plant life. It starts out with very simple plants, probably close to the shoreline. That's mostly what you would have seen in the beginning, early of the Devonian. As the period goes on, plants develop roots. Vascular systems become more and more popular until you have ecosystems of shrub-like plants. And in the Devonian, we see plants evolve. One of the most delightful plant innovations, wood. Yeah. Which allows them to develop into the first trees. We see our first forests. Yes, we do. So you have these first big forests. It also means that you see 
proper organic soils for the first time. By the late Devonian, you're looking at land ecosystems that are familiar in the sense that they're not barren rocks covered in, you know, algae or whatever. Well, th this is the time when we see the first true prototype terrestrial ecosystems. Yes. Like, this isn't alpha where it's some weird shoot plants. Right. It's not lichens. It's yeah. not little shoot plants. It's familiar plant shapes. Now, it would look weird compared to what you're used to seeing today. You know, there wouldn't yes. be the ground coverage of grass. There wouldn't be a lot of no. the... You wouldn't see flowers. No. Nope. So you'd be missing a lot of the familiar thing, but it'd be a forest. And you would see some of the earliest ferns. Yeah. You would see seed plants. This is around the time that plants evolve seeds, proper seeds. Well done, plants. They don't have like pollen and not like today. You know, they're not they're not all fancy. Same diversity yeah. like today. Like you said, no flowers yet. Episode 57, Evolution of the Angiosperms. Go check that out. We're not there yet. <laughs> But you have plants. So you have this diversification in the ocean. You have these massive reef systems with the earliest vertebrate-dominated communities. On land, you have these the early forests that are coming to be dominated by uh, vertebrates as well, by, by amphibians moving up. There are a number of famous fossil sites from the Devonian around the world. I'll mention a few. There is the Rhiney Chert in Scotland. Well-known. Famous Lagerstaten. Lagerstaden means it's got ridiculously cool preservation. It's really good. The Rhiney Chert is early Devonian, silica deposits, and it preserves some of the earliest vascular plants. Vascular means they have basically a, quote, bloodstream. It's, it's vascular, veiny. Yes. It's when you look at a leaf through the light and you see all those spider webby veins. It's the earliest version of that. And they have veins going up and down the stem and through the roots for transport of water and nutrients. Much more efficient. leaves to roots. Than constantly having to use puddles to do that for you. The Rhiney Chert also includes some of the earliest evidence of plant-fungus relationships on land. Oh! Which is pretty cool. Wow! It's, those two have been together for a very long time. That pretty much. A, that is a lasting relationship. It has been argued that without fungal symbiosis plants would not have made it onto land the way they did the unsung heroes and they're still doing it <laughs> in west australia there's the gogo -go formation late devonian which preserves reef organisms <gasps> yay also a lager famously uh preserves around 50 species of fish wow. of all kinds you got your placoderms your sharks your spiny sharks also famously well preserved with gut contents and fetal remains inside oh, right. yeah it's it's a super cool fossil site miguasha national park in quebec is a unesco world heritage site great for sarcopterygians lobe finned fish there are devonian outcrops i remember when i was in penn state there are a bunch of devonian outcrops uh, around pennsylvania nice and then of course up in ellesmere island is where neil shubin and friends discovered tiktaalik very famous the famous discovery. fishapod yes <laughs> the in-between stage uh, from true fish to land-dwelling amphibians. Your inner fish. Your inner fish. So the Devonian is this really important time period. Like, a lot's happening in this time period. We find all sorts of cool evidence of this ecological rev revolution all over the world. And then... Ooh. It all goes horribly wrong. <laughs> this is the inciting incident yes. <laughs> in yes. our story. <laughs> so, as the Devonian draws to a close during the late Devonian, so the, the, the period is actually split into early, middle, and late Devonian. Through the late Devonian, we see extensive loss in life, particularly animal life, which is most of what our evidence is from the fossil record. It's always really hard to quantify just how much life is lost due to, during a mass extinction, but the numbers that I consistently found online were roughly a decline of roughly 70 to 80 percent of animal species and roughly 20 percent of animal families. Wow. <laughs> so comparable to the Permian extinction, the K the Cretaceous extinction, the Triassic extinction, we're looking at a big deal loss of diversity. This is something that was was would have been felt across the globe. Yes. This the the, the switch is basically 
from between the start of the, Devo- the late Devonian and the end of the late Devonian, you have lost a ton of things. What sort of patterns do we see in this extinction, I hear you ask? Lots of benthic organisms suffer. So benthic means dwelling on the seafloor. B for bottom. B for bottom. So benthic foraminifera, which are, uh, we talked with Adrian about that in our yep. Spotlight series, tiny, uh, a little tiny, tiny shell forming organisms. Trilobites suffer majorly in this extinction. Uh, a number of big trilobite groups go extinct completely. Brachiopods get hit real hard. Yeah. Uh, eventually, brachiopods are replaced in their dominance by bivalves, clams and oysters and mussels and stuff. This did not help. This, this is one of those extinctions that may not have completely wiped away yeah. some, of, some of the groups, but, but it, it could knocked, easily be blamed. Knocked them off their, their dominant yeah, they're seat. Yeah, off the pedestal. We almost lose aminoids. Oh. Aminoids are reduced to a very small survivor group that later gives rise to the familiar ammonites we know in the Mesozoic. Too close. Placoderms, the armored fish, do not make it past mm-hmm. the end of the Devonian. Uh, certain groups of tetrapods, some of those early amphibian groups like Ichthyostega and its relatives, do not make it past this extinction event. So these big groups that we're, we've are we been seeing dominate the Devonian, a lot of them either completely disappear or lose a big chunk of their diversity. And this is something, we, we've noted this on other extinction episodes, but at the museum today, uh, I was asked by a kid, pointing at the timeline in the the fossil hall why did dinosaurs die and the little mammals shown next to the dinosaurs not die mm-hmm. and i was explaining it's it's not that they didn't die lots of them did yes but more of them survived than did the dinosaurs there was some luck to it and here you know it's easy to think oh yeah placoderms obviously we can extinct because we don't have those but tetrapods must have been fine because we are still here Right, right. Nope. No. (laughs) That's not how it works. Some of them made it. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) As we've discussed in the past, certain types of organisms and ecosystems tend to suffer worse during extinction events. And if you'll remember our discussions from episode 36 and 55, it should not be a surprise to you that reefs had a real bad time. Yeah. Those beautiful, extensive Devonian reef systems are hit super hard major losses in reefs i've i read it described as a fundamental collapse of the reef system that's just that's harsh terminology one of the papers i read described that the reef reef diversity was reduced by a factor of (laughs) 5000 now i don't know where that number comes from or how it's quantified but it's too big (laughs) but it's a big number the point is just (laughs) ah colossal losses major declines in those tabulate and rugose corals we don't have those anymore today they survive past this they don't they they make it all the way to the permian extinction before they're done (laughs) it's it's all along the way being like no no we're gonna bounce back we're gonna what's that ahead (laughs) yeah exactly but they get hit real hard the reef building stromatoporoids also hit very hard just all the reef creatures diminishing yes And then a lot of the reef organisms have a real hard time, like the brachiopods, which were a big component of reefs for a long time. But with the reefs being hit hard, so too were the reef dwellers. Reef ecosystems have a very uh, semi-counterintuitive existence in the fact that they are one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. Like, not just in the ocean. They rival most terrestrial ecosystems, minus maybe the most diverse areas of the tropical rainforests. Yeah. But they're in a Goldilocks zone of depth and temperature. And if either of those get messed up, that lush ecosystem just goes away. And it's easy to start that chain reaction. It does not take much. If the water goes up or goes down, that's it. The temperature goes up or goes down. Oh, that's it too. If both happen, well, then I don't know what you expect them to do. (laughs) All in all, ecosystems, especially marine ecosystems, suffer a huge reorganization. Now, as patterns go, the Devonian, the late Devonian mass extinction is interesting because it appears to be 
multiple extinctions. Ah. Spread over a pretty wide period of time. So researchers have been looking at the Devonian mass extinction and have identified multiple events, not just multiple pulses of extinction, like what appear to be multiple events, multiple things that happen. By like separate... Separate extinctions. Causes and, and extinction. Interesting. There is disagreement over how many different events there were. Some have argued as many as eight to ten pulses of extinction throughout the late Devonian. Others suggest that they were long. There were there were long stretches of crisis punctuated by a couple or a few big spikes of extinction taking place over the course of the last twenty to twenty five million years of the Devonian. Okay. So this is an extended crisis. Yeah, this isn't some quick eruption or asteroid to the neck. It is... Right. This is a long battle. And as you'll see, that makes it... That's much more difficult to try to identify exactly what happened. Gradual things are are much less distinct. However, there are two events that are generally agreed upon and often discussed through the late Devonian, the Hangenberg event... And the Kelwasser event. The Hangenberg event happens at the end of the Devonian. This is in cap. Devonian leading into the Carboniferous period. End of the Devonian around 359 million years ago. It appears to be seen in all ecosystems. On land, in the water. I have seen, again, it's always, numbers are always difficult. But I have seen estimated numbers as high as over 96% species loss. Yeah. So, big deal, one way or another. Yeah, jeez. Sometimes I have seen people point to this event and say, this one is one of the big five. Yeah. This event. Yeah. Not everybody agrees with that. (laughs) This took place over what appears to be several hundred thousand years, which is more in line with individual extinction events like we've seen in the Permian, the Cretaceous. Uh, Apparently, right there on the boundary, big Hangenberg event. But 10 or 15 million years before that was the Kelwasser event. This is one that some uh, evidence seems to suggest was mostly a marine extinction, but that over half of all genera may have disappeared in this extinction event. And I have seen some articles, some, some studies point at this one and say, this is the big five extinction of the late Devonian. With the real mass extinction, please stand up. Yes. Like, it's, it's, it's. <laughs> I've seen, uh, I've actually seen uh, at least one article that argued that the Kelwasser event, the earlier one, was not as big as it seems to be, that it's been misinterpreted. There's, there's some back and forth over exactly how substantial were these events, exactly where do they stand in relation to each other. How awful was your awful event compared to my awful exactly. event? Exactly. Suffice it to say, two events that seem to show dramatic devastation on global ecosystems. One thing that's very interesting about the Kelwasser event, the earlier one, so this one takes place, it's between two ages of the Devonian. So the Devonian period is split into early, middle, late, and each of those is subdivided into various ages or stages. Which is, that's... You would find that in a lot of periods if you zoom down yes. into it. All periods will have that. The last two of the Devonian are the Frasnian and the Fomenian. This event happens in between those. Okay. Around 375 million years ago. But it has been argued, and in fact argued by Alicia Stegall, Dr. Oh. Alicia Stegall, who was in our Spotlight series, that this event is not really a mass extinction because it does not appear to show elevated extinction rate, but instead reduced speciation. Oh. That it wasn't that the that there were unusually high extinctions, but that the normal extinctions that were happening were not being replaced by new species developing. Interesting. So you had a drop in species level, but... It wasn't because everyone was busy dying. They weren't evolving new species. Weren't being replaced. That's really interesting. And she argues in at least one paper I read that it is thus better described perhaps as a biological crisis. Yes. Than a mass extinction. This is where something was throwing everyone off their game. 
Yes, and no one was was functioning as as one would hope. A biodiversity crisis. To be more accurate, a biodiversity yes. crisis because diversity dropped, but it wasn't because of a spike in extinction. More on that in a little bit. That's a, that's one of those very weird distinctions that it's hard to to yeah. really tease out exactly what it means un, until you look at it up close. So whatever the pattern was, those beautiful reefs are destroyed. Some of our beautiful new forests are destroyed. Lots of the dominant animals suffer immensely. Over the course of a couple dozen million years, all that work the Devonian put into building up super cool ecosystems is diminished immensely. So we know the extinction event happened. We see it in the fossil record. And this, of course, raises the question that everybody always wants to know about all the extinction events. But why? What was it? Let's talk about that after the break. Good idea. In our previous extinction episodes, we talked about how determining the exact cause of a mass extinction is always super difficult, often because that's it's not that simple. No, we want it to be. We want it to be this uh, asteroid hit or a volcano went off and then the villain snapped. Yes, right, right. And then everything was decimated and that was that. But that's not usually how it is, even for extinctions that were relatively short. Yes, this is a series of extinctions over many millions of years. And so it is very difficult to say this is what happened. It is a series of unfortunate extinctions. It is indeed. But there are a number of things we know were happening at that time. And there have been many suggestions to try to explain what may have been behind these changes. So here's what we know from the geologic record. We know that this was a time of repeated intense climate change what believe it or not sometimes changing climate is correlated with extinctions so it's not always good for them. <laughs> <laughs> there were bouts of warming and bouts of cooling throughout the late devonian at the end devonian during that hangenberg event there is evidence for extensive glaciation so an ice age yeah uh Evidence of ice sheets in the southern continent, South America, South Africa, because Gondwana was down toward the South Pole, and potential evidence of glaciers in the mountains of your America. So high elevation glaciers like we still have today. Yes. Ice sheets in the southern continents like we still have today down in Antarctica. There's also a possible evidence of glaciation during the earlier Kelwasser event. So you saw repeated pulses of cooling and warming. So the chemical evidence of this time, the geological evidence, shows us these up and downs of the climate. Extreme temperature changes. And as temperature changes, it tends to go along with sea level changes. Because that ice has to come from somewhere. Transgressions and regressions, rise and fall of sea level. Temperature changes can wreak havoc on ecosystems because just like we see today, organisms that are accustomed to behaving certain ways at certain times of the year get thrown out of whack. Sea level changes can be especially damaging because coastal ecosystems and near shore ecosystems like reefs tend to be affected rather intensely when the water levels rise. Yeah, I mean, it's, you're specialized to live on the beach or live near the beach, and now yeah. the beach is over there. At least one incident uh, during the end of the Devonian that I read about cited an estimated 100-meter drop in sea level during one of these glaciation events. Wow. Which is... That's similar to the what we've seen uh, in recent Ice Age. Yeah. Where you had these transgression regressions up and down of sea level. So we know this was a time of climate and oceanic change. There's also lots of evidence for chemical changes, geochemical changes. There is abundant evidence for anoxic oceans, which is to say oceans or regions of the oceans depleted of oxygen. This is not good. We also have evidence for high sulfide, right? Sulfur chemicals being high in certain areas. So you're getting eutrophic conditions where your regular chemicals are kind of out of whack there's evidence for major 
fluctuations in carbon deposition. So how much carbon and carbonate minerals are being deposited in the sediments. These sorts of changes can be linked to both biological activity. So anoxia is something you can get, right? Low oxygen can happen, particularly in places with a lot of uh, microbial activity. Yeah, they can use it up. Yes. So you get algal blooms and stuff, and that not only can reduce oxygen, but depending on what kind of microbes are active in your region, if it's sulfide-producing bacteria, for example, now you're going to have high sulfur conditions as well. They can also be linked to disturbances in water circulation. Oh, okay. Disturbances in the carbon cycle. So your organic matter, your carbon, is being moved around in ways that it hasn't been uh, standardly. So chemistry got all out of whack during the course of the late Devonian. So it's not surprising that we're seeing extinctions linked to these things. In fact, everything I've just listed, we have mentioned in previous extinction episodes. Yeah. These sorts of things tend to go hand in hand with drops in diversity. It's it's very weird sometimes when talking about it, mass extinctions because even if the specific causes of like, you know, oh, well, your continent moved into a weird part of the globe and the climate changed or something hit the globe or a volcano. Like, even if the cause is different, a lot of times the symptoms of what actually is because like you know as we've said before the asteroid is not what killed the dinosaurs it did not hit all the dinosaurs the volcanoes did not erupt on all the animals right but they caused a side effects on the the planetary ecosystem yes and often they're very similar because there are certain things that are just not great for stable ecosystems and like we've said before like i loved saying the way you cause a mass extinction is you pull the rug out from under the ecosystem Take out the supports, and then you knock out that last support beam. If you poison the ocean, doesn't matter if only certain parts of your e ecosystem are being poisoned. If it devastates the reef builders, then your reef collapses, then all the organisms that live in the reef collapse, then the organisms that eat those organisms collapse. You have disrupted the structure of the ecosystem. Yes. Changing temperatures, changing sea levels. All you need to do is put enough stress on the ecosystem that it can't quickly recover, and then you collapse. Yeah, and, and it may be a very quick collapse, or as it seems like it could have been here in the Devonian, it could be a very gradual collapse, but it's something that happened. And when we see this on small scale in ecosystems all the time, yep. this predator is removed, which means this animal increases, which means this plant suffers, which means this animal starts to suffer which means this animal starts to increase you know it's that trophic cascade but in a negative sense yes but of course none of this change happens out of nowhere no nope. so geologists and paleontologists have tried to find links to why these things may have happened and those suggestions have included some favorites <laughs> volcanism has been brought up um, there is a series of the what, what are called the Vilui Traps in Siberia. So traps are extensive deposits of lava flows. We talked about traps during the both the Permian and Cretaceous mass extinctions, yep. the Deccan Traps and the Siberian Traps, which tend to form from extensive long periods of volcanic eruptions over and over and over again, over tens and hundreds of thousands of years, which can wreak havoc with ecological chemistry, right? Environmental chemistry and atmosphere. So there is a deposit of traps in Siberia, not the Siberian traps, this is east of that, which have been dated to around 370 million years or so, which is close-ish to the first major event we talked about, the Kelwasser event. Okay. So it might be linked, maybe related. Others have brought up Asteroid Impact because it's an all-time favorite. I, w once you realize it can happen once, check for it every time just in case. Look for craters. And indeed, there might be one. Oh. In West Australia, the Woodley Crater, which is a biggin' about 120 kilometers across. It's no Chicxulub, but it's just, that's not a small <laughs> crater. It's nothing to sneeze at. Has been dated to around the end of the Devonian, 
right at that Devonian Carboniferous boundary. There are there's also evidence of impact products, right? Im- impact debris in Australia and China. So some have suggested that maybe this impact was also related, like we discussed extensively in the End Cretaceous episode, episode five. An impact throws all sorts of stuff into the atmosphere, can affect atmospheric chemistry, which can affect ocean chemistry, and just create a big, devastating blast. Not blast like an actual physical blast, but also like, here's a bunch of chemicals that aren't supposed to be where they are. Yeah, just suddenly, you know, it's not a slow release. It is a flashbang of stuff from your ground all of a sudden in the air. Yes. Where it was never meant to be. And you're blocking sunlight, and you're creating acid rain, and all sorts of chemical chaos. So it may not be a coincidence that there is a big impact around the same time as these extinctions. I found at least one paper describing orbital cycles. Oh, yeah. So we've almost certainly talked about this. Uh, We must have talked about Milankovitch cycles. I know we've mentioned it. Probably episode 25. That's my guess. And Pleistocene extinctions. (laughs) The Milankovitch cycles describe the repeated patterns of changes to the Earth's orbit and position. So the Earth's tilt wobbles, how close, how, how, how oval-shaped or spherical the Earth's orbit around the sun changes over time. There's also precession, which is hard to describe, but it means that the Earth slowly over time kind of twirls like a top that's about to fall over. Yes. And these patterns tend to happen on fairly regular time intervals. And so some scientists have tried to get a sense of the timing of different events through the late Devonian and found potential evidence that they might link up to these orbital cycles. Intriguing. And in reality, it's probably multiple events. All of these things may be related in some way. In fact, since there's if if the evidence is sound that they happened, they probably were at least somehow involved in these changes over time. Well, it's and we've said this in previous mass extinction episodes as well, but f- to have a mass extinction, you have to pull your support system out from under the ecosystem. And that takes a lot of stuff to yeah. do that. So it would make sense that it happens during times of coincidence. It's, right, hey, a few things one after the other. Bad timing on on that new traps that you decided to form because there's an impact coming up. Or or we're particularly stressed by this, this series of climatic shifts. Yeah, it's, it's just a weird weather, weather cycle because of, you know, whether it's Milankovitch cycles or something else to where uh, uh, a unusual amount of droughts and then something weird and we just don't have the stability to take it. So it's not going to be one big cannon blast. Now, all of those things we just listed are the classic abiotic events. That is, the Earth's doing weird stuff. But other researchers have pointed out that oftentimes one of the biggest obstacles to the success of life is life. And this is at a time period of dramatic change in living ecosystems, particularly land plants. So this has led to what has been what I've read called the Devonian plant hypothesis, which basically blames plants in part wow, plants. As we discussed, the Devonian period sees the rise of forests and extensive land plant ecosystems. This involved two major innovations: seeds, which allowed plants to colonize previously inaccessible locations. And here's a vocab word for you, arborescence, oh. which means forming trees. I like it. And what all these plants have in common is that they anchor themselves into the ground, tear up rocks, collect and deposit organic material, and create soils. Proper organic soils, similar to how we know them today. And when you're suddenly covering your land in a new type of sediment in abundant soils, that's going to affect how your sediment is moving around and how your nutrients are moving around. Yeah. So with lots more soils, what we would expect to have seen is more weathering, 
because the soils are going to weather more easily. Yes. Weathering is the chemical breakdown of soils in contact with air and water. And runoff. Runoff, rain and such, washes soils into the ocean, which is carrying all these nutrients in a concentrated load into shallow oceans. Yep. And when you have lots of nutrients, you attract life. And the life that tends to get there first tends to be microbial. And that's how you get algal blooms. Yeah. If you've heard of red tide, that's what that is. A concentration of nutrients in the water makes it a wonderful time to be algae. And then those algae start to deplete the oxygen in the water. This is the issue with blue-green algae, which has been fairly confidently connected to fertilizer runoff human fertilizer runoff Mm -hmm. like where we use too much fertilizer on our crops yeah and you would think oh fertilizer is good for plants and uh, some gets in the water it's good for plant and it is and it is and they literally choke rivers yes the blue green algae grows so much that it kills off basically everything else in there so with the rise of land plants we may have seen that runoff creating anoxic conditions right choked waters all along coastal areas in a way that would not have ever been seen before the other thing that plants do is they take in carbon dioxide they terraform plants breathe in carbon dioxide and you know what else takes up carbon dioxide chemical weathering yeah the chemical process of weathering uses carbon dioxide traps carbon dioxide in the sediment Plants bring in carbon dioxide to fuel photosynthesis, which means now you have all these soils and now you have all these forests and they are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And here's some Earth System Science 101. Drop carbon dioxide, you drop global temperatures. Yep. The relationship between CO2, which is a major greenhouse gas, and global temperatures is very well established. So some have suggested that with all this plant diversity you are inadvertently because they're not planning any of this messing with the oceans and messing with the climate that they are literally terraforming yeah they are adjusting the ecosystem and atmosphere just by how they breathe and eat just by existing Mm -hmm. now that does not mean that the rise of plants is solely responsible for the series of extinctions in the late devonian The takeaway is that plants are evil. That's exactly, absolutely. And they're here to kill us all. Allie's not here to defend them. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen through your ruse, yes. Allie. <laughs> but this could be a major stressor on the ecosystems. So it may not be a coincidence that we see shifting climates, shifting ocean chemistry at this time where we're seeing this diversification of plants. Yeah. So All those factors or some of those factors may be involved in this stressful time period that life is dealing with. But there's one other thing I want to mention, and that is going back to this suggestion that the Kelwasser event was not a mass extinction, but a biodiversity crisis. Yes. How do you end up with conditions where your extinctions aren't particularly high but your origination of new species is exceptionally low. Lack of emotional connection. Now, here's a callback. If you remember back to the third episode of our Spotlight series from last September, when we were talking with Dr. Alicia Stegall, she expressed her interest in invasive species. (laughs) She has done research on this time period in that same regard. Because... Uh, She has made the point in her papers that you have these periods of high sea level, especially as it's fluctuating, raised sea level. And when the sea level rises, you are connecting areas that were not previously accessible. You're linking ocean basins. Yes. Right? The two parts on either side of this reef, now you can swim over it and make it to the other side. What this means is that you would have had higher rates of invasive species and the most successful organisms in that condition are going to be the ones that are able to survive in the most places. Yeah. Like we said early on in the episode, specialists tend to suffer. So if you are a type of organism that was living in this one little lagoon, and that was the only place you could live, and then the sea levels rose, and that one species of shark came in that can live anywhere. Yeah, the rat shark. 
that's going to start taking over all over the place. You have less separation, which means you're getting less distinction between your environments, between your ecosystems, which means specialists are going to suffer and generalists are going to do much better. So what Alicia and colleagues have suggested is that what we're seeing, so what research has suggested is that what you would be seeing at this time period is that organisms are going extinct, but they're not being replaced by new specialized species. They're being replaced by a smaller number of generalists. They're being invasive, uh, replaced by the invasive species. That come in and just fill the same niche, 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 niche that they were in. So instead of having three different basins with three different species doing the same thing, one invasive species has come in and is now in all three places. Yes. Well, and this is the one of the big concerns with modern invasive species. Yes. Because often the topic that will come up when invasive species are discussed is, yes, but wouldn't the, won't the ecosystem find a balance? Because you know, that's something that is taught and is true. It, eventually, ecosystems will balance. But what you will end up with if, if our reckless abandon to taking animals everywhere with us... <laughs> is let to go to its ultimate conclusion is that we will have balanced ecosystems around the world that are all made up of cats, dogs, pigeons, and rats. Yeah, they're going to be much less diverse. We're going to have a effectively almost a global monoculture. Yeah. It's the issue with like the palm forests used for palm oil is it's yeah. not that it's yes, it's a forest, but it's only one thing, which means most of the species there can't use it. Yes. To survive. And that's what you could end up having is we'd have equal amount of biomass, perhaps, but of five things versus 500. Right. Same that's number a... of trees, but there's only two species yes. instead of 20. That also makes ecosystems more susceptible to dangers. Because if you only have two species of trees in your whole forest and a disease comes in. And in one spe only one species go extinct, you've lost 50% of your biodiversity. <laughs> yep. So... It may be that that earlier event, if indeed it is a drop in origination and not a, a, an increase in extinctions, is just a sameification. Yeah. A loss of differentiation. It's a drop in diversity without actually... It's not a mass extinction. It's a mass replacement. It's a mass invasion that just ended up after a while leaving you with significantly decreased diversity. And if this is what happens, it introduces such a weird paradox because invasive species... Now, human-introduced species is different because that is something that's happening at a speed unbeknownst to yeah. the globe because of planes, trains, and automobiles. Yes. Good Episode movie. 55. But it's a natural process. Like, Oh, yeah. It happens all the time. Animals will naturally invade. This happens on islands. It happens... You know, something yeah. is blown as well plants and, and algae and all sorts of things. And the only reason it happens is because the animal that becomes invasive, the invader, is really good at what they do. Yeah. They're more successful at it than the animals that are there, either by being a more utilitarian, you know, a more uh, generalized animal, or not being susceptible to the predators or threats right. that are present in this new place. Weeds are excellent survivors. Oh, they're so good at what they do. <laughs> That's why they're annoying. Most of the things we consider pests are the best survivors. Oh, yeah? I love cockroaches. Cockroaches are like <laughs> the Swiss army knife of the insect world. It's like, do you want me to squish like an octopus? Because I can do that. <laughs> and... That's why they're so difficult. So it's this weird paradox in that it's a natural process. You're only doing it because you're a good survivor. Yeah. And yet you could cause the eventual collapse of the ecosystem you've invaded. So what the late Devonian seems to involve is a series of changes that compounded on each other and just led to this prolonged crisis. The biggest difficulty. So uh, uh, we've listed a whole bunch of ideas and I have yet to say, and this happened because it, it the, the difficulty is the, there's a lot of difficulties. But the main challenge is it is very difficult to establish accurate timing mm -mm. of events and extinctions. Does this particular glaciation 
and this particular volcanic eruption and the extinction of this group line up? Do they actually sync or are they out of sync slightly? Do these two fossil groups actually go extinct at the same time? Or is our fossil record tricking us into thinking they did because it's kind of, it's it's incomplete? Well, it's the news we went over recently with the, the potential new uh, uh, extinction date for Megalodon yeah. completely overturns potential reasons that were presented earlier with the previous date because it's out of sync now. Because it's out of sync. And we had a, a bit of news a while back that showed that you get false extinctions in your fossil record if you're not careful. And this is one of the oldest events we've ever discuss- ever devoted an episode to. And the farther back in time you go, the harder it becomes to get preci- to, to get as precise dates. The more incomplete the fossil record tends to be, the more incomplete the geologic record tends to be. So it's they're just it's very difficult to interpret the evidence we have in a way that nicely lines all these things up. The way I always think about the resolution going back through time is kind of how we talk about uh, uh, modern human history, where it's like, for us, we talk about things by year in our lifetime. It's like, oh, that came out in 1998, and that happened some, you know, somewhere in the uh, uh, early you know, 20 teens. But then you go back to the 1900s, and it's by decade. Yeah. And then eventually you get to where you're like, oh, yeah, the 1700s, you know, all of it. Right, right. And that, the, and eventually you're just going to be, t- you are just talking about like, oh, yeah, and then somewhere in this thousand years, we formed civilization. And the farther back you go, that resolution continues to degrade. And so this is why there's all this disagreement. This is why we haven't yet settled on exactly what happened. But the general view seems to be a bunch of changes happened, repeated changes. Climatic changes, chemical changes, ecological changes that seem to have come together one way or another to create over about 20 million years an absolute collapse of that wonderful world of the Devonian. It's like an environmental legion of doom. Which brings us to the next question, the epilogue, right? Our we, we've our action has fallen. <laughs> Yes. And now we are in whatever the last part's called. I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry, film people. I know. We we claim to be film fans. Right? I know. I don't know the, the, the five-act structure. <sighs> we like movies. <laughs> <laughs> the aftermath. Yes. What was the world like after the Devonian extinction? Now, I want to talk about three things. Two things majorly. What it was like right away and how recovery took off. And I have to mention a famous phenomenon in the fossil record called Romer's Gap. Oh, yes. Romer's Gap is a period of about 15 million years or so during the early Carboniferous, the period that comes after the Devonian, where the fossil record just seems to be missing things. Yeah. Notably, tetrapods, land vertebrates, and even arthropods, terrestrial arthropods, are just really hard to find in this time period. The fact that this gap in the record of these prominent groups happens directly following the Devonian extinction makes it very tempting to say, well, obviously, all the animals were gone. (laughs) And that's why we have this gap, which might be the case. However, a lot of researchers have stepped forth and said, "Eh, this is probably a fossil bias. Yes. Because the fossil record always does little tricky things. So some have argued that it's not a real gap, and the more we keep searching, the more it gets filled in. We've been finding more and more things in Romer's Gap that make it seem less like a gap. Well, this is the period where they were all hiding in their bomb shelters. Yeah, well, they were like, is it safe to come out yet? No, not yet. Are the plants gone? (laughs) (laughs) However, others have suggested that this might actually have been an ecological lull. Uh, Some have tried to tie it to oxygen levels and found some evidence to suggest that oxygen, atmospheric oxygen, environmental oxygen levels were low for a while. And then when they recovered, radiations in these groups could rebound. So maybe Romer's Gap is related to the extinction. Maybe Romer's Gap is real. (laughs) But the jury is out. That's always the difficult things 
that's always the difficult thing with these kinds of events is the exact cause is is potentially vague and variable and the validity of the event is vague and variable <laughs> so it's it's hard to really tease out what you're seeing regardless as we move out of the devonian and into the carboniferous things that we do see are lessened diversity and disparity mm -hmm. so not only do we have fewer species and families and genera but they are, are they are more samey yeah we've we lost have... a lot of our specialists weirdos immediately afterwards we see and there is a huge loss huge lack of reefs and certain forest types a lot of the animals in the water that are doing well immediately following the extinction are deep water species deep water animals interesting because the shallow tropical seas suffered immensely. So the ones that are still doing okay seem to be deeper water, at least in some cases. Another interesting shift, for about 30 million years or so following the extinction, vertebrates, fish and tetrapods, are unusually small. Oh. Fish and sharks and tetrapods are dominated by small, quick-breeding species. Typic they tend to be less than a meter long makes sense considering that those are often some of the the species who have the easiest time yeah. populating and, and pioneering an area you breed fast you use not a lot of resources yep. that's who's going to do well in a resource poor world you die and adapt quickly but that's not the case everywhere crinoids apparently were doing great <laughs> so crinoids again sea lilies stem arms up in the thing they're still around today much more popular popular abundant back in the paleozoic <laughs> crinoids do not appear to be severely impacted by the extinction and in fact according to a paper i read about crinoids they reached their peak richness in the beginning of the carboniferous oddly co convenient which, for the crinoids which has been called the age of crinoids they, on average, were bigger following the extinction for a while. Weird. Yeah, I like your suggestion. Yeah. Oh, oh, doing well, are we, yeah. crinoids? Yeah. You sure <laughs> seem to come through this unscathed. <laughs> now, it's been suggested that the increase in size, at least, might be due to increased pressure from the kinds of fish that were around at that time. That there, there may be, there, it looks like there may have been a rise in hard like, like crushing jawed fish yeah, that are you know getting hard shelled organisms off the sea floor so it was a defensive adaptation to be tougher yes. to eat so ecosystems were out of whack some organisms responded by getting smaller others responded by becoming <sighs> richer and defensive up, up. they hate when you do that in the longer run as things begin to recover in vertebrates we see very little recovery in certain groups of fish, like the spiny sharks, the lobe fin fish, mm -hmm. and some of those early tetrapod groups. But on the other hand, cartilaginous fish and tetrapods in general, as a group, land vertebrates, rise to dominance. Woohoo! So the Devonian, a lot of the popular fish during the Devonian, like the placoderms, the spiny sharks, are out or diminished, and more modern style fish more your ray finned fish, your, your cartilaginous fish, are now beginning to become more dominant, more like modern-day ecosystems. Here's a fun fact that I, I, one of the papers I read made this point, and I thought this was great. In the end of the Devonian, when you look across tetrapods, the earliest vertebrates on land, the number of digits they have on each hand and foot is highly variable. Yeah. So you see, you know, Five fingers, seven fingers, six fingers, all different kinds of finger numbers. After the Devonian extinction, five <laughs> is the max number that tetrapods have settled upon. We purged all the rest. That was that was the bottleneck, right? Five is what survived, and all of us tetrapods have five fingers max now because that's what made it through the extinction. Which once again brings up that question of, was there something about was you know, that the golden number five? Was there something about that that gave you an edge, or was it just a roll of the dice that we don't have seven fingers? Yep, <laughs> base ten. Yes, <The> superior. 
in the even longer run, it is millions of years before we see reefs start to really recover, before we see uh, all the forests start to recover to the same levels they were in the Devonian. Certain things don't come back. Brachiopods, we're still around today, but they don't. They're never as big as they were back in the Paleozoic. The old style corals, tabulate and rugose corals, like I said, hang on to the Permian, but they they never achieve those reefs like they had again. Their heyday. Way later, more modern reefs will start to appear in the Mesozoic and into the Cenozoic, as we discussed in episode 36. Mm-hmm. Just because I always like to mention them, trilobites lost another chunk of their diversity in this extinction. They're still around, but much, much reduced. Just uh, still scuttling. Still scuttling around. So certain groups suffer. Other groups take advantage of this and are able to fill the space. Eventually, we will get reefs, proper reefs back. Eventually, uh, uh, the, the tetrapods and forests and stuff on land reclaim. And as is always the case, following this mass extinction or extinctions or biodiversity crises, <laughs> the world looks a little more modern. Yep. It was a huge catastrophe. There was a big lull. And then when the dust settles and things start to, to find their balance again, things are a little more like they are today. It's It's a very interesting point of view to look at history as less than a slow gradual march toward what we see today and a slow cutting down yep. <laughs> progressive chopping out <laughs> until all we have left is what we see today and that's i think that's a a point of view that is so often not uh, examined because it's typically just made to see it's like and that that gradual march toward the modern world seems to suggest that this was the destination. Right. While the more accurate point of view is that there were gradual there's gradual marching going on. Things are developing and evolving and changing, and every now and then all of a sudden half the contestants are eliminated. Yes. <laughs> and everyone that's left has to rebuild. And those so happen to be the ones that we're built off of. Like, yeah. we we are the result of a series of very lucky survivors that ended up making a, their way through each of these massive extinctions. So we owe a little bit of thanks to the plants or climate cycles or volcanoes or asteroids or whatever is happening. The cry, the cry, <laughs> the devious crinoids. I love it. I love picturing crinoids just putting their, their arms together <laughs> mm. menacingly. Mm. Devonian mass extinction. There are more extinctions for us to discuss in the future. There is one other Big Five extinction, and we are always uh, taking suggestions for more. Hopefully you have a, a renewed appreciation for how the world has come to be as it is. Before we wrap up, we have a patron question. Oh, boy. So patrons of a certain level on our Patreon get to send us questions that we will answer on the podcast. This question comes from Julie. Hi, Julie. Who says, great turtle episode. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, we worked hard on it. I appreciate it. That was episode 60, everybody. Have there been any biomechanical studies of marine versus terrestrial turtles to see if the reduced carapace, back of the shell, in marine turtles might have to do with the mechanics of swimming as opposed to walking? Intriguing. Biomechanically, Julie asks, do we know if the shell's reduction, because Aquatic turtles tend to have a reduced carapace, like we discussed in episode 60. Is that because it makes it easier to swim? Yeah. I don't know. No. But I know a guy who knows things. So we reached out to our friend Steve, Dr. Steve Jasinski, who does turtle stuff. And I sent him this question. And here's what he said. Ahem. Steve says, There have been studies looking at aquatic versus terrestrial shells, in particular groups, mainly emitids, which includes a lot of your familiar box turtles, sliders, things like that, showing that shell shape consistently varies between habitats. Okay. So that between terrestrial and water, you do see there is a correlation. Which makes sense because those two places are different. And there have been histological studies, that is bone tissue studies, on sea turtles, showing the environment has led to consistent shell structure mainly due to the environment. So when you move into the sea, your shells are reacting in a specific, consistent way. However, Steve continues, 
I don't believe anyone has looked biomechanically at the transition back to the water. So it sounds like, at least to Steve's knowledge, no one has really got, okay, what changes are happening because of the land to water shift? Because of how you're moving now. Part of the problem, says Steve, is we only have two sea turtle families left. And almost all are Chelonians, with the leatherback being off in its own family, having a completely different type of shell. Yeah, not even (laughs) close to a normal turtle shell. Way weird. So this is a problem we encounter a lot when trying to interpret evolution, is if your end members are just super weird, it's hard to parse out all the factors that got them there. Once again, the sloths, that kind of situation. Most sea turtles, says Steve, even early ones have reduced shells, potentially due to some form or forms of pedomorphism, which is retaining juvenile features into adulthood. And this may, he suggests, have been due to less weight being a useful trait, just being less heavy, easier for moving through the water. More likely, says Steve, due to less need for a complete shell for protection, that you don't you know, you don't need to be as well protected if you're in the water. You're more yeah. mobile. You're dealing with less of those sites of dangers. But, he cautions, some of that gets into the question of the initial evolution and purpose of the shell, <laughs> which is heavily debated. Check out episode 60. So it's hard to say for sure what the change in purpose was when we don't fully understand the original purpose of the shell. Well, and there's so many biomechanic things that, that would come into play being fully aquatic buoyancy is one of those and thermal regulation you know we see that with certain like the leatherback where it keeps itself fairly warm because it's in cold water so like there's a lot of things that changing your skeleton is going to affect yeah and it i don't know most studies on shells steve declares use finite element analysis and look at differences in stress on different parts of the shell or use morphometry so anatomical analysis, and discuss differences that way. But with sea turtles, the flow of water over and around the shell would be important. I don't believe anyone has looked at the shells in regards to their hydrodynamics to determine if that caused the shape of sea turtles early on and led to the shells we see today. But, he says, it would be a very interesting study to undertake. Cool. So to answer your question, Julie... No, yeah. but but it sure would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Julie for the question. Yes, that was very interesting. Thank you to Dr. Jasinski for offering up a, a, a comprehensive, very and fascinating answer. I wouldn't have had that answer. <laughs> I like the patron questions because na- every like two or three questions now, I read it and go, I know who to ask. Yes. <laughs> so I just ask somebody else. <laughs> I don't know, I don't but know. I know who does. <laughs> But that's quite enough episode for this episode. As always, we hope you've enjoyed our discussion of extinction. Episode 75, we will return to the topic of extinction. So please feel free to make your own suggestions about what you want to hear. And in general, make suggestions about what you want to hear, even for all the other episodes. Yeah, let us know, once again, if you want to hear more on this topic, a different topic, or questions about something we mentioned, we're always open-eared as you heard at the beginning of this episode in the news in our napc talk we have received hundreds of suggestions but don't let that dissuade you the more suggestions we get the better off the more suggestions we get for a particular topic the more demand there is for it we will respond and sometimes we get a suggestion that's just so cool we want to do it right away yep so yeah keep them coming let us know what you want to hear Get in contact with us all the usual ways. Listen to the outro thing. Thanks, as always, to our patrons for helping us get to NAPC and for helping with our planning for the future Dragon Con, our next public appearance. Yes, indeed. We release episodes every fortnight. We don't record them every fortnight. We record them on wacky schedules when we do (laughs) silly stuff like filling the month of June with a thousand projects. With everything. But you can look forward to not realizing any of that's going on in the back end. And another episode, episode 66, right? 66. Yeah. Ooh, ooh yeah. 66. We should have talked about an extinction in episode 66. Yeah, that would matter. Shouldn't we have Will? <laughs> but now we ramble. Do we want to thank the requester on the tail end? Oh, sure. That's a good idea. Thank you, Matthew, 
for suggesting the episode and anonymous survey person. Yes. For inspiring us to do, to work our way through the big five. Thanks, survey. You're always a really uh, uh, engaged <laughs> listener. <laughs> Have I forgotten anything else? I can't think of anything else you've forgotten. Well, bye, everybody. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.